and put his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come in the evening or in night, midnight, or when the rose, rooster crows, or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, church. Good morning, church. Are you awake? Yes. Then I test you. Just now in the Bible passage, one verse was read twice. Do you notice which verse was it? Ah, okay. Some of us are nodding head. Some of us are saying the number 27. Praise God, you are awake. Okay. So listen to my sermon. Uh, Tell me. If I repeat myself a few times after the service, huh? don't need to raise hand later, okay? But I thought today as we begin our season of Advent appropriately, or maybe you think that inappropriately, why are we talking about this passage, Mark 13, 24 to 37? Aren't we supposed to talk a little bit about Christmas, you know? After all, Advent is supposed to prepare for Christmas, right? But for today's meditation, I thought it's helpful for us to answer this question first. Where is God? Today, where is God? You come for worship service and you often hear the worship leader, the pastor will tell you, God is here with us. Right? When we worship Him, God is here with us. Maybe you remember the person that brought you to Christ and says, you need to receive Jesus into your heart that God will be in you. Maybe you have heard people also say, they look up to the sky and say, God is in heaven. Where is God today? All that I have said just now are true. They are true statements. But I want to acknowledge that today, there may be people like you and me who came for worship service, we feel a little bit like the pictures that I put up on the screen here. Where is God? It is true. I know the Bible tells me that God is everywhere, right? God, the big word is omnipresent. God is everywhere. He can be in the heavens. He can be in your heart. He can be in our worship services where thousands of churches gather at 11 o'clock right now to worship God together. We are in different places, but God is there. But yet, there are times in our lives where we feel like what the sermon title is saying. Where is God? I know God is there. The Bible tells me so. But when I wake up in the morning, I feel the pain in my body and I've been praying for God to heal me. Where is God? Or maybe you meet that person again, that broken relationship, and you have been praying for that relationship and you ask yourself in prayer, where is God? Or maybe you are seeking God for a certain direction in your life. What to do in 2024? No answer. You don't know. You are still very vague about it. And you ask yourself, where is God? This is the exact reason why in church we celebrate Advent. While the world gets ready for Christmas, they begin to celebrate. Maybe you are invited already to many Christmas meals, celebrations and parties. The world is celebrating away in December because it's Christmas. But in the church, we say, wait a minute. Because there are some amongst us who are waiting for God. But our waiting cannot be like we wait for 811. Ayah, so long, you know, never come. I look at my app, it says two minutes, now become four minutes. Isn't it supposed to become one minute? Where is God? Sometimes in our waiting, it may feel like we are waiting for something that is unpredictable, something that we don't know whether it will really happen or not. And that is the reason why we celebrate Advent. We need to wait correctly. That if we 
if we are waiting the way the Bible describes, our waiting will cause us to have hope. Our waiting will cause us to have greater faith. What do I mean by this? Today, we come to this passage. Jesus kind of summarizes what the Old Testament has been talking about, the end times. If you read Ezekiel or Joel, or if you read Daniel, ah, some mind-boggling books, you come across many images. These prophets are given a chance to see the end times. So if the end times is so amazing, very hard, nah, very hard to write down exactly what it is. So often, if you read the Old Testament as well as Revelation, you come across images. The, the prophets try to describe as far as they can with their human language, with their own experience, what they see that is out of this world about the end times. So Jesus kind of guides his disciples in this passage in Mark 13 to reflect about these images of the end times. So in the same way, today we reflect on Jesus' words to remind ourselves, until the time is ripe, where God will fully redeem all of His creation, we learn to wait. And so what then, what then does it mean to wait? Would you turn your Bibles with me to, Matthew, uh, to Mark chapter 13? And we begin with verse 34 to 31. It's interesting that here in verse 24 onwards, Jesus likewise gives some images to his disciples when he talks about the end times. Jesus explains to them, these are the signs that you need to look out for. The sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the heavens. Well, quite scary, huh? The powers of the heavens will be shaken. Interesting that Jesus chooses to use these images to tell us the signs of the end time. Why? I think it's because many of us, actually all of us, huh? Christians or non-Christians, we depend on the lights to govern our day and night. So isn't it quite scary one day there will be no more sun? One day, there's no more moon. It is scary to us, but Jesus' point is this. It's not about the scary things of the sun, moon, and stars. It is that something greater is coming. Today, the sun and the moon and the stars can look very great to you, but Jesus' point here is the Son of Man is coming in clouds with great power and glory. You know, it is when something greater is there, something lesser, you don't need it really anymore, right? So Jesus' point is, while you enjoy the sun, moon and stars today, when He comes in clouds with great power and glory, it will be much greater than what we have experienced today. And what is also interesting is, in this image that Jesus gives, His point is also this, Everyone will know when the sun no longer shines, the moon no longer have light. Every single one that is living, whether you know Jesus or not, doesn't matter. You will know that the end times has come. I think what is even more encouraging for me is when we look at the next sequence of events that happens, the signs, right? There's no more moon, stars and, and sun then you will see the Son of Man, Jesus, coming on clouds. What is the next move? The next move is that God will gather all His people. God will gather all His people. In other words, here Jesus paints for us a certain sequence of His coming. His coming is so sure it's so certain that today Jesus calls us to wait. Wait for His coming. Watch for these signs because when they finally arrive, it will mean that you and I will reunite with our loved ones 
in Christ with God in heaven. You know, to highlight the certainty of this truth, right, that this thing will really happen, Jesus goes on to use a common day example of fig trees, uh, fig trees that are well known to the people of Jesus' time. Uh, you will equ equate fig trees, figs, uh, a bit like durian to Singaporeans. Uh. When you talk about this uh, particular fruit, people, everyone knows about this. It's popular, yeah? Popular enough for people to have seen it, to have seen it grow. And so Jesus' point is that just as surely as you see the branches of the fig tree becoming soft, just as surely as you see the green leaves appear, you know that summer will arrive. Summer arrives means that the fig is ready for harvest. It means that it is time once again to taste of the sweet fix, the fresh fix for the harvest of that year. So Jesus' point using this example is that as surely as each year you enjoy the fix from the harvest, so surely you are reminded that Jesus will come back again to bring his people home. Here today, I want to be very honest with you as I meditate on this passage I think this teaching of the Bible is not often at the top of our mind. Huh? We all know, we all know that Jesus will come back again. We all know that there will be the end of times one day. But after all, it has been 2,000 years, right? Since Jesus said these words. Nothing of what Jesus has said has happened so far. So the question is, what then is the point of Jesus' prophecy about the end times? I give you an example. Huh? Today, if you walk home and then you reach home and then somebody is standing at your door and says, congratulations, you have won a lucky draw. We are going to renovate your house for free. And then the person show you the proof. Huh? Huh? Not, not fake news, okay? Not a scam, not, not a salesman trying to... Really, if it's, uh, the guy shows up and, he, and then you go home wow, feeling happy. Wow, finally, you know, can renovate this house. I stay here for many years already, right? Then maybe you gather your family, you sit down, and you talk about, oh, uh, this thing needs to change. Huh? It has been broken for many years already. Uh, this furnishing, uh, maybe we need to buy a new one. Huh? Uh, maybe the room can change the layout a little bit. Huh? We can be a bit more modern. Uh, maybe the digital lock needs to come in. We need to make our home a bit more modern, huh? have some new technology. And then you begin to think, and your family to discuss. A few days later, you still continue at your family meal to keep talking, um, have the checklist and you know, keep changing, keep changing. And then a few months pass, then you sit with your family and wonder, ah, yeah, we should have saved that reno list on the phone because uh, now cannot find the paper. Don't know what, what we talk about already. Maybe after a few more months, the next time when your family talk about it, you realise that ah, yeah, this, this guy that offered us renovation is not coming back. Uh. We don't know. We don't know whether renovation is true or not. Let's get on with life. Sometimes when we think about Jesus coming, what I've just described about the renovation, doesn't it sometimes sound true for us Christians today? We know, we know that Jesus is coming again, but nothing that we do in our lives reflect this truth that Jesus is coming again. And I believe this is the reason why Jesus chooses to highlight this truth at Mark 13 before he goes to the cross. To the disciples who think that, ah, okay, la, Jesus is here, la. Don't, no need to worry, okay? Yeah, he will take care of us. But Jesus knew that he is going to leave them soon. So he comes to bring out this same truth that has been spoken by many Old Testament prophets. And Jesus weighs in on this truth. He says, after explaining to them about the end times, He says that heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. The words that Jesus just described about the end times, about His coming, will not pass pass away. Jesus weighs in for us today about this truth that's written in the Bible 
that everything may change in our lives, but this one thing will not change. He is coming back very soon. Brothers and sisters, do you truly believe in Jesus' second coming? That is not just a truth that is written in the Bible that's abstract, but have you received this truth in your hearts? Because if we truly believe that Jesus is coming back again, then our lives will show it, right? In times when you face the difficult circumstances that I described at the beginning of this sermon, at times when you face difficult circumstances that never seems to go away, have you decided to be hopeless? Have you decided to give up altogether? If you believe in Jesus' coming, we will hope even in the darkest time because we know that the end, the end is bright. That the perfect end is so sure that the dark times, the difficult times that we face at present will pale in comparison. So dear brothers and sisters in Christ, are you very sure in your heart that Jesus is coming back again for you? This is the reason why we celebrate Advent. Right? We are so sure that Jesus came born as a babe in a major. We are so sure that we are able to tell our friends when they celebrate Christmas, Jesus is the reason for the season, right? This is the reason why we celebrate Advent, to strengthen our heart once again that Jesus is certainly coming back for us. Even in our darkest moments, we can hold on to this truth that the end when Jesus comes again will be perfect, will be bright. So brothers and sisters, as we begin to prepare for Christmas, let us remember Jesus' words here that we can be hopeful because He promised that He will deliver what He said. No matter how bleak our world is, we can remain hopeful. Today, you may turn to the news and wonder, why is there another war going on? Today, you might realize around you that the moral standards in our generation is becoming lower and lower. And then on the other hand, you see the cost of living becoming higher and higher. The world looks so bleak, right? War, low morals, high cost of living. What is there to live for? Today, all these may make us feel like we are at a bottomless pit, dark, and where is God altogether? Jesus' words shows us otherwise. He calls us to take a step back. Don't just look at your present situation. Look at eternity. That He is coming back soon. That our wait for Jesus today is worthwhile because we know that the end is bright. That when the end comes, you know, today our minds can't even comprehend what that perfect state will be. This Advent, I encourage you, if you are feeling down, if you need to go out and celebrate with another Christmas gathering, and you just don't feel like doing it, my encouragement for you this Advent is, before you go out to celebrate, sit down for a while and begin to dream how will it be light when Jesus finally comes? How will it be light when there is no more tears? No more pain, no more sorrow when Jesus finally arrives again. Be hopeful, for Jesus himself has told us in this passage that he will deliver his promise. And so today we can wait with certainty because of what Jesus has told us. So while you dream about Jesus' second coming, what are some concrete things that you can do, right? 
Jesus goes on in verses 32 to 37 to tell us something concrete that we can do. You know, after affirming of his guaranteed uh, coming, right, through the sequence of events, through the lights that will fall, through his coming in the clouds and the gathering of his people, Jesus goes into an unknown factor of his second coming. He makes it plain to all of us. No one knows the hour or the day where he will come. Okay, so today if you, if you read on the news saying that Jesus is coming on this date, this date, you know. You can quote verse 32. Straight away, fake news, okay? Somebody come up to you and say that, oh, I have a prophecy that Jesus is coming when and when. Ah, read to the person, Mark 13, verse 32. No one, oh, wait, unless the person is God the Father, okay? Because it says in this verse that only God the Father knows the timing of Jesus' second coming. So Jesus' point, I think, in giving this is just so that you won't be fake, lah, huh? you, you won't be scammed by somebody else. But more than that, I think Jesus' point is also telling us, don't try to guess, lah. No one knows, okay? Even he himself also doesn't know. So don't need to try to guess. Don't waste your energy there. Instead, Jesus channels our energy to, to stay awake. I hope you're still awake, huh? Yeah. Have I repeated myself? Uh, no, right? I, I hope I have not. Huh? Jesus, interestingly, in this passage, used the stay awake four times. You know, when the Bible repeats itself, when the word is used more times, it shows us that emphasis. So the question I have for us today is, what does it mean to stay awake? What does it mean to stay awake? Is it that you must open your eyes 24-7? No, right? Jesus knows that we need to rest, right? Uh, God created us with the Sabbath day in mind. So Jesus goes on with a parable to explain what it means to stay awake, right? He gives us a story, a story about an owner, Probably a rich owner, he's going, to be, he's going away, he's going to be absent. So he put his team of servants in charge, in charge of his or her home. He tells them, you know, you must continue to take care of my house. Everything that I've given you in charge, you take care. You must take your responsibility serious and not be lazy. So interestingly, this story seems to be implying us a little bit. Huh? I hope you see that God is your master. He has gone away. He has given you in charge of some things. Maybe your family. Maybe He has give, made you a homeowner. Maybe God has given you a certain ministry. Maybe God has given you influence over some people. Jesus' story reminds us to be alert to stay awake means to be alert. Be alert in taking care of your responsibilities well because we all know it takes that one moment of sleep, that one moment of dozing away that the burglar will come and steal all that belongs to the owner. To be awake means that we are not idling away as well. So brothers and sisters, every day and every moment, to stay awake as Jesus commands us, it means that we need to learn to be faithful in the responsibilities that God has assigned to each one of us. Whenever Jesus gives warning, I feel a bit scared. Lah. He says this, lest he comes suddenly, and find you asleep. I hope you don't go away thinking that Jesus don't allow you to sleep. Huh? Oh, doesn't mean that we, need, we cannot take a break. Huh? We encourage people to go on holiday, take a break, go away, retreat, and spend time with God. It doesn't mean that God is trying to tell you, you just do, slog your life away for me. That is not what God means then what does Jesus mean by telling us not to sleep and to stay awake? Awake and asleep is a metaphor, is an image that 
Jesus gives that is often spoken about in the Bible like Apostle Paul does when he talks about sleeping. So, be sleeping means that spiritually we are dull. What do I mean by that? Sleeping Christians are something like this. They go out, you shake their hands and they say, yes, I go to church, I'm a Christian. But then you look at their life, eh? this one, how come always lying? One, huh? This one, how come, you know, a bit not honest huh? in his uh, business dealing? These are sleeping Christians. They carry the title of Christians, but in their life, in their behaviour and character, they are asleep. They are nothing like Christians. Spiritually asleep Christians also know all the lingo. They can tell you Jesus died and rose again on the third day. They can explain to you what is the meaning of Christmas and Easter. But yet, you notice that these spiritually asleep Christians, when it comes to obeying God's word, they are, no, 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 no. I only choose these things to obey. Okay, these things God say, never mind. It's okay. Maybe next time, next time. These are spiritually asleep Christians. Or in other, another way that you detect uh, Christians who are asleep, huh? oh, they, they come to church uh, very fervent. Oh, you see them sing songs, they lift up their hands, ask them to serve, they will serve. But then when you go into their house, you see how they live their daily life. They are often so distracted that you can only find Jesus in their life on Sunday morning or perhaps in the days that they serve in church or come to sell, maybe they will show that they are a Christian. In their daily life, God has become not important at all. Dear friends, are you spiritually awake today? I'm quite sure that all of you, your eyes are open, I can see you. Physically, you are awake. But dear friends, are you spiritually awake today? I encourage you to do this exercise since it's December. If you want to know if you are awake spiritually this year, look back at your year. Have you been struggling? Are there times where you, at the end of the day, realize, oh no, I didn't read the Bible. I didn't pray. I better, better do it. Do it now. And then you do it and then you fall asleep. And then the next day you try again. If what I have just said describe you May I suggest to you that you are spiritually awake because you are struggling. You are struggling to put God at the center of your life. The, the Christians who are spiritually asleep, they will be indifferent whether they do Bible study, whether they come for cell, whether they even pray to God every day when they, before they take their meal. Today, if you come to church, and you wish that you have a stronger relationship with God, may I suggest to you that you are likely spiritually awake. Or perhaps there are times in your life where you feel it's so hard to be Christian, right? So hard to stand on God's truth. Whether it's in your work or as a parent or as a child, it is so hard to be that Christian in your circumstance. If you feel that it is hard, may I suggest to you that you are likely to be spiritually awake. Because you are trying to be that little Jesus in that circumstance, but it is difficult. And my encouragement to you is stay awake. Like what Jesus tells us, don't fall asleep. Don't become indifferent even though the circumstances have not changed. Even though you may be frustrated with yourself, how come people can do quiet time every day? I cannot. How come people know how to pray? I don't know how to pray. Continue to fight that good fight of faith. Continue to stay awake, dear friends. Because spiritually awake means that we are ready for God. We need to maintain that readiness in our lives, even though we may feel frustrated with things that never change. We need to be ready for the end, to be ready when Jesus comes again. You know, if we maintain that readiness, my sense is that our life will then be well spent for God. 
You know, often in December, I, I always come with this dilemma. Many people are setting goals, making resolutions. I've reached a point after doing 20, 30 times, wondering if I should still follow the trend or not. What is interesting is in my own sermon preparation, I decided this year for 2024, I will not make any new, new year resolutions. But instead, I will hold on to this truth that Jesus is coming again very soon. I will wake up every morning and tell myself, today could be the last day that I'm living here on earth. What should I do? Because Jesus might come back tomorrow. Should I be idling away? I think if you have one day left to live, you probably won't be idling away. Huh? You won't be bothered with the trivial things in life. You will invest your time in things that are important. And this is my own resolution for the new year. That every morning I will tell myself that Jesus is coming back very soon. With that thought in mind, I wish that I would then be spending my energy and my time in things that will matter in God's eyes. Dear friends, what have you been busy with in the last few weeks? May I encourage you to, to think this thought every day. Jesus is coming back soon. Hopefully, we can finish our sermon and then Jesus will come back afterwards. <laughs> Jesus is coming back soon. As gospel people, we cannot afford to forget this truth. Because you know what? Jesus is going to come back that one time. No full dress rehearsal, okay? When he comes, finish. The people that you want to evangelize, no more chance. The people that you want to make a difference for, no more chance. When Jesus comes, it's the end of time. Full stop. Period. As gospel people, we need to remember this truth. We cannot afford to forget this truth. We need to ask ourselves, what are we busy with? What are we busy with? Because you know what? Let me conclude this sermon with this thought that I leave with you. You know, in my own meditation of why, why did Jesus, you know, incidentally, in all the Gospels, Jesus talked about His coming to His disciples. Why, why did Jesus talk about His coming? He hasn't died yet, right? I think Jesus is being very transparent with all his disciples. He has set all his disciples a question at the end that he will ask. So he's giving us an open book exam. This is what I will ask you. What have you done on earth? It's an open book. So you can choose how you want to answer. But you know that at the end when Jesus comes, he will going to ask you this question. Jesus tells us what you and I will be tested on at the end of the day. I'm very curious. What will be our final answer to God? Today, we talk about Advent being a time of waiting. The truth is, every second, we are closer to Jesus' coming. Second coming. Our waiting not only has hope about the end, our waiting calls us to be active because the time will come when it is night. No more chance to work for God. Finished. Done. Are you ready to give your final answer to God? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we bow our heads and quieten our hearts, Lord, what a weighty message you have given us today. Thank you for reassuring us that even in our darkest time today, 
we can wait with hope because we know that the end when you come that things will be made perfect. So Lord, would you stir up in each one of us here that urgency to work for you, to stay awake to the end of time, Lord. Would you grant us the courage to look beyond the trivial things in life, to embrace what is important for you and you alone? Lord, we have been wanting to put you at the centre of our life. So, would you help us, O God? For we know that you are not coming in the next hour because you want more people to come into your kingdom. And so, Lord, would you help us to persevere on with the gospel work that you have given to each one of us? Would you remind us again and again of your coming? to the broken people in our lives that we are serving, would you grant us the courage to serve them, Lord, so that they may know Jesus Christ? Lord, we come humbly before you, remembering that as surely as you will come in a major, yet that you have came in a major, the Lord, you will come again in the clouds. So help us, O God, to be ready every day to spend our lives well for you and you alone. Because Lord, we want to be able to answer you finally and to hear from you, well done, good and faithful servant. This is our prayer, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's rise to our feet and sing this as a response song. Yes, are we ready? Do we have a story? Do we have a song? Follow the Lord. Blessed assurance, Jesus, He is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine Heir of salvation, purchase of God Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood this is my story This is my song Praising my Savior All the day long This is my story This is my song Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture burst on my side. Angels descending, bring from above, echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior 
all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed. Walking and waiting. Looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story. This is my story. This is my song. Raising my Savior. My Savior, all the day long, praising my Savior, all the day long. Good morning. Good morning. Wow, this loud. Welcome to YMM. Welcome to Asian Methodist Mission. Uh, now worship together. We want. We have a newcomer today. Uh, we have Mr. Philip Limantara. Are you here, Philip? Okay. Uh, probably behind the pillar. I can't see. Huh? It's okay. Welcome him. All right. For those of you who are around him. Now do do uh, look us up at the so, our social media for updates. If you are online later on. Okay, after the delayed telecast and you are new, you are worshipping with us first time, I encourage you to use the QR code scan and we would like to welcome you. Alright, there are a couple of things that we need to uh, keep in mind. We are really thankful for God's goodness last Sunday. Alright, uh, we thank you for coming to celebrating together with us our birthday uh, as a church. Thank the Lord. And... Uh, we are also very thankful for our brothers and sisters who came to assemble the new chairs. All right, we are, yeah, I think there are still a lot more, right? Yeah, so we, as and when the time comes, we will encourage you to come and let's serve the Lord together through um, assembling the chairs. All right? Next. Okay, just a reminder, uh, this afternoon will be the second practice at 1.30. So those of you who have signed up, have signed up as carolers, all right, you have agreed actually from the text to attend two practices. Okay, so this week and next week, right? So do, rem do have a good uh, lunch and then after which we come together. Next. Okay, uh, today we had our second session of the, whole, uh, the baptism and uh, membership class. All right, uh, next week we will have uh, it next Sunday, same time, same place. Those of you who attended will know. Next. Okay, Christmas baptism is a combined service, English and Chinese together. All right, on the 25th of December, on a Monday, we are coming together to rejoice together with our brothers and sisters who are taking a step of faith and obedience to the Lordship of Christ. All right, so... Uh, when we come together, we want to really welcome them into the family. So I encourage us to just turn up, all right, to celebrate Christmas together and 
yet at the same time, welcome our brothers and sisters in our midst who are coming in officially. Okay, and next uh, Sunday, on the 10th of December, uh, Pastor Ching Son will be preaching uh, from Mark 1 verses 1 to 8. The topic is returning. All right. Uh, so let's continue to pray for her as she prepares the message, as she gives us the Word of God. Let's all rise. Let's sing our Sand Forth song, and after which I invite our Reverend Bernard to give us the benediction. Soon and very soon We are going to see the King Soon and very soon We are going to see the King Soon and very soon We are going to see the King Hallelujah, hallelujah We are going to see the King and no more crying there We are going to see the King No more crying there We are going to see the King No more crying there We are going to see the King Hallelujah, hallelujah We are going to see the King No more dying there, we are going to see the King. No more dying there, we are going to see the King. No more dying there, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we are going to see the King.